Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Brie Noble, and I am here with another Brie. It's crazy. Yes. I don't think I've ever had another <laughs> Brie. I guess I had a Brianna, Brianna on the show one time, um, but I think she spelled it with an I. But like mm -hmm. Brie, B-R-E, I love that. It's very short. It's very uh, distinctive. And that is her artist's name, and that's actually her real name, too. So yeah. that works out well. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get into all of the, she's done so much, um, I think, to really help, you know, creating pathways for artists to make income that she kind of started for herself and then was helping other artists do that. So we'll get into all of that. But first, I'd love to find out your backstory, Brie, like, you know, how did you get into music and what made you decide to like pursue that full time and that whole story up to kind of where we are now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk about all this amazing stuff that you go over in your podcast. Um, so in regards to my story, uh, I have been um, a musician and a songwriter since about the age of 12. Uh, I went to an acting and singing competition when I was about 13 years old and I won. It was like this random thing that I decided to do. And because of that, my parents decided that they wanted to move to Los Angeles for me to be in the industry, which is always interesting. So we we came out here and I basically pursued music for the next 10 years unsuccessfully. Um, so I was like putting all this effort in, I had a lot of uh, managers and agents who were like, we're gonna make you into the next Taylor Swift, the next Demi Lovato, the next Haley Williams, trying to kind of mold me into something that they felt would be successful um, to no avail. So did that for about 10 years. And then I was like, you know what? I'm done with music. I'm done with all this. Like I, I need to leave. And so I moved to Texas. And then after that, I actually moved to New Zealand um, for about six months. Just try. I know. Like, I literally. Really was, I, need to, yeah. I need to get as far away from LA as possible. <laughs> so I left the country, went as far as I could, which was actually exactly what I needed to do because when I was there. Um, I rediscovered my love for music as an art form um, rather than a catalyst for my success. Mm. I real I was like, no, this is actually who I am. Like being an artist is such an integral part of just the fabric of my identity. And I need to really reconnect with that as an art form. And so I was able to do that there. And at that point, when I was in New Zealand, I was like, all right, I had a choice to go back to Texas or I could go back to LA. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go back to LA. <laughs> I'm gonna do this thing again. So I moved back, and um, I kind of fell into doing dueling pianos. Um, for those who are unfamiliar, it's basically you have two people on a stage. We take requests, and we do a bunch of interaction with the audience, and we just play all kinds of music. Um, I just fell into doing that because I had looked up bars with pianos in them in New Zealand, and I found some bars that I started doing residencies. And when I came back to LA, I did the exact same thing. I found a dueling piano bar called Howl at the Moon. And so I started working there. And then when the pandemic happened, kind of really started looking into my artistry again, since I had to break some time to kind of figure out creatively what I wanted to do. And from that point on, started a couple of businesses and now am pursuing my artistry full time. Mm, that's, that's very cool. And what it amazes me about what you're saying about the pandemic is like, okay, I can't do live performances. And, and it's great because it does make you take a break from that. And like, okay, now I can really look inward into my artistry yeah. and stuff. But you weren't just doing that. Like, you're like, oh, let me start these businesses uh, <laughs> because I see this need in the marketplace. So like, what made you have the confidence to be like, I can just go ahead and start this business where I see a need? Yeah, for sure. Um, So What's interesting thing about the businesses um, is that I met my co-founder, his name is Art Herrera, and we, we met on a Facebook networking group for musicians. And what was so cool about that is that he 
basically offered his services as a music consultant for free. He's like, hey, we're in the middle of the pandemic or at just the beginning of it. If anybody needs to talk about their art, I have time. And I was like, cool, well, I'm a, you know, starting to kind of figure out my artistry. I reached out to him. And once we started talking, we just connected really well. He's amazing, incredibly smart, has a background in entrepreneurship. And I was telling him about how I wanted to, I started doing a live stream piano bar on Twitch. Um, I was doing weekly shows where I would take requests, people would send in tips and I would, you know, just perform realized that there was a need there because there was a lot of companies that used to do live events with music in them. Um, and those had all obviously stopped because of the pandemic. So we decided to actually go ahead and start a virtual entertainment company called Live Sounds, where I would be the main performer. And then we ended up actually hiring other performers as well, eventually. Um, and we would just put on very interactive, really fun musical shows based around the piano bar concept. It was called Project Piano Bar, um, where people would be able to make requests. We'd be able to play games with them and kind of take the place of those live events and just doing them live, but doing them virtually. Um, and so I'd say to answer your question, like the getting the confidence, I think it's about having the right collaborators in that moment. You know, I starting a business by yourself is very possible, but it is also very difficult having someone that you can kind of bounce ideas off of, someone who can motivate you and keep you going is really amazing. Um, and then I also think that sometimes you just have to go for it. Like it, the idea of starting a business can be very scary when you look at it as like, okay, a business, like this is a, this, this big entity that I have to figure out when in reality, it's like, it starts as a project. It starts as an idea. And then you just kind of like take the necessary steps. And if you see that it has potential, cool, I can make this a business. And like you, then you do it from there, you know, but I would kind of encourage people not to be too scared about the idea of starting a business just by just, you know, doing it organically, doing what feels right to you and seeing if there's a need for it. Yeah, that's so true. Like a lot of people get caught up in there. Well, I can't just, I can't start until I like get my LLC and I get right. my logo and I get my website. Right. No, you just, let's make an offer and see if people accept it and they want to do it. You know, that's the most important thing I would say, because like, if you start with, let's get a logo, let's get an LLC, let's get a name. And you haven't identified what you're selling, or if there is a need for it, then you're wasting a lot of time and money by trying to do all this preliminary stuff before you understand if your business is actually needed in the industry. Yeah, totally. So how did you guys find clients for live sounds? Did you already have kind of a line on people that were looking for this? Oh, cold emails. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, we um so we we started off by looking at our own contacts and that's something that I always recommend people to do is like okay, once you identify what your offering is and who the person is who needs it. Um in our case, it was businesses and academic institutions who were used to doing live events and could no longer do them identify people in your network who would need that, offer them the product for a discounted rate so that you can get some reviews, get some footage, get some photos. And then once you have that and you have basically the validation from your clients, then you're able to take that and then start cold emailing. I, I've i emailed thousands, <laughs> thousands of people. And literally just by looking up, you know, businesses who have really good company culture, who would be more likely to do this. Um, colleges that are known for throwing really awesome student events and kind of really just scouring the internet, finding emails of the people who would be in control of creating those events and emailing them. And you'd actually be surprised. We got a lot of responses. We got a lot of people who are interested. You know, we had a good amount of events that we did. And I think if you word your emails correctly to being like, not, hey, give me your business rather than being like, I want to offer you this thing that I think could be really helpful for your students. And here's why, based on the research that I've done on your website, um, you'll be surprised about how many people will get back to you like that. Yeah, absolutely. Because you're tailoring it to them and always thinking about what's in it for them. Yeah. And, you know, when I think about it, it's like, we think we have nobody in our network, right? That could be a perfect fit. But when I start to think about it, it's like, okay, well, my husband works for a university. Like right. my mom has a friend who started this really big computer company. Like, you know, it's like within your network, if you think a few levels out from your network, you probably do have contacts of people that you could start with. And like you said, Absolutely. Get those few people under your belt and get your testimonials and stuff. And yeah. then you've got some awesome things to send out in these cold emails of like, look at this testimonial from this like reputable place. And yeah, you know, here's a video that we did and you know, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Like solid business building principles. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, so then you, so you started that and then you also started something else during the pandemic, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So basically when we were doing live sounds, what we were doing is we were using a live stream platform to stream our performances, but we were recognizing that because Piano Bar is so interactive, we really wanted to have a level of interaction with our audience that we weren't able to have with live stream. Live stream is just one way video. People are communicating with you via chat. So what we would do is we would actually get our audience on Zoom, have our audience on a Zoom thing, and then be live streaming and having those two windows open. And we were like, okay, no, this this could be a business. We need to create a platform that is specifically made for entertainers who are wanting to do interactive performances online and making it specifically for those people. So we made this platform called Showcast and it's been, you know, over like the last two years we've developed it and now it's working and it's, we're hosting artists on it and it's awesome. But what it is, it's a platform made specifically for entertainment online. You're able to see and hear your audience. You're able to adjust your audience's volume one of the things that we found when we were doing research for this product was that people were using Zoom uh, a lot for their performances, but they were having frustration when you want to be able to hear your audience's reaction, especially if you're a comedian, a magician, a musician. But when people would clap or laugh, it would always cut into the audio of the performer. Yeah. And also the, you know, the quality of video of the performer was at the same quality of video as the audience member, which is not necessary. You want to have a higher quality for your performer. Mm -hmm. So we were finding that a lot of people were having these issues. And so we basically addressed all of those in, in Showcast. So here's your audience, adjust their volume. The performer has better video quality than the audience member. You have a backstage area where you're able to bring people in and on and off the stage and you're able to sell tickets to your shows and it doesn't cost you anything. We just put uh, an amount on top of the ticket for the ticket buyer. So again, really did a lot of research because of live sounds. We were talking to a lot of performers saying, hey, what do you need? Like you're doing a lot of virtual performances. What are your frustrations when it comes to the platforms you're using? We took that information and then we created Showcast based off of that. Got it. So now you're using Showcast when you're doing the live sounds performances? Yes. So what we've kind of done is we've we've transitioned from live sounds. We've kind of put that in the back burner. Now we're really focusing on Showcast. So we aren't doing as many live sounds performances now, but we are really getting an onboarding artist onto Showcast to help them start using it to continue to cultivate their audience. It, it allows for a more intimate connection with your audience when you're able to see them rather than just doing it over live stream. So that's become our main focus at this point. Yeah, I love that. And just to go back to live sounds for a second, like, do, yeah. do you think people are still doing virtual, like wanting that kind of virtual event anymore now that things are a little more open? Yeah, the the need has gone down a lot. And that's why we've transitioned from live sounds into showcast because now what we're doing with showcast is instead of focusing on providing virtual events for or corporate academic whatever we're really targeting artists who are wanting to connect on a deeper level with their worldwide fan base who cannot come see them live so it's like you know you're not able to come to my concert but i can do a concert online for you have a conversation with you from the stage and create that intimate connection with you and so now we're kind of more focusing on the artist's ability to cultivate that kind of strong fan base rather than the kind of corporate need we had before. Got it. And I know it sounds like you've really done all your research and figured out what people really need, but you know, artists know about all the other options, right? So like I've interviewed side door, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously zoom is a thing. Like, where do you think you guys really have niched down to, to be something different from those other options? Absolutely. So what we have found is that first of all, zoom is made for business, right? Everyone who does a business conference usually does it over zoom. So what we have found in our interviews with both audience and artists is that the idea of going on to zoom to see a show when they were just on zoom for business, <laughs> it, it's tough. It's tough right. to like, want to get your audience see a cool concert in a conference room. Yeah, exactly. It's made for business. The the aesthetic of Zoom and mind you, Zoom is awesome. They know what they made and it's for We're business on Zoom purposes. right now. So yeah. exactly, exactly. But it's for business purposes. And so, you know, trying to get your audience to come to Zoom, especially now that things are open 
when they've been on Zoom all day doing remote work is tough. So really creating a product that's specifically made for you to do a show, it looks like it's a venue. Mm. Um, it, you know, we have the aesthetic down, we have the, the whole experience down to make it actually an entertainment experience. Um, along with the features that I mentioned of like being able to turn down your audience, the better quality, the backstage options, um, and also the ability to sell tickets. Um, that's where we feel like we really niche down where we're not trying to take over Zoom's business. We right. will we'll leave that to them, but we're trying to cater to the artists who are finding frustration over Zoom and other platforms and bring them over to Showcast. Well, and especially the sound too, because the Zoom Zoom is frustrating when it comes yes. to the sound. Sometimes it's got the gating and you know all mm -hmm. that stuff. Which is perfect for if you're in a conference and you have background noise, whatever, but it is awful for when you're trying to perform. You know, so it's then they're not they're not catering to that, and that's fine. They know their business, they know who their customers are, and we do too. So that's why we really focused on the audio portion of it. Um, we have like patent, you know, patent pending technology where again we're able to adjust that volume to make it so that when you are performing, you're not having your audio cut in and out. It really focuses on the audio, especially. That's very cool. And what about the aesthetic? Are you able to change that? Like, say you're you know, you're a rock band, okay, and you want a certain aesthetic, or you're like a folk duo, you know, mm -hmm. can you change what the staging looks like? That's a great question. That's actually something we're going to be doing very soon. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things in our pipeline. And what I will say also is that as I've been focusing on my artistic career, art has really kind of taken up the mantle, and he's the one who's heading all of this, as I'm kind of like providing more of the um, the background information of like talking to artists who kind of bringing them over to him. We were kind of like in complete partnership with this. And then as I needed to focus on my music, he's like, all right, I'm taking it from here. So what we're doing now is we're talking together about how, what kind of features are most needed. The aesthetic of it is definitely something we have in our pipeline. What we're wanting to focus on right now though, is the ability to help musicians and performers in general make more money. So we're going to be integrating tipping into the platform very soon. Um, and then also making sure that the functionality works best before we really focus too much on the customization of the aesthetic. Right. And what about the ability for them to like, you know, like a regular show, like be able to sell merch afterward? Do they just need to put in like a link to their merch or are you going to have any more like integration with that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's another thing we're going to be having very quickly in our pipeline. Probably it's going to be an integration with Shopify mm -hmm. um, just and because they have a lot of ability to be able to easily embed like a store into a platform. So that's going to be another thing along. It's kind of like our monetization stage that we're going to do is um, going to be integrating the tipping uh, with either like Venmo or uh, like PayPal or something, as well as the embedding of a store like Shopify into the platform. Got it. Very cool. Very cool. And they can sell tickets in advance. Yeah. Um, does it have a, like, how does it, how does it interface with the ticket buyers? Does it have like email reminders or with ill links and things like that? Yes, it does. So basically what they do is they go onto the showcast platform, they buy a ticket for the show, and then they will get an email confirmation of their receipt. And then an email on the day of the show saying, here's the link, go ahead and log in. Uh, all they have to do is click that link. They create a really quick um, account where they just put in their name, their email, and a password. Then they're done. What's great about Showcast too is you don't have to download an app, unlike Zoom. You know, you have to download something from the computer. This is all browser-based. So you just log in, and then you are brought into a waiting room um, where you're able to see a either picture, video, whatever the performer sets. Um, where you can watch that while you're waiting for the show to open. You'll see the full lineup of the artists who are going to be performing, including their pictures and their names, as well as a chat option where you can start chatting with other people in the waiting room, as well as the artist uh, before they open up the room. And then you're able to go into the venue. Got it. So if you have multiple artists performing, can they be in different locations? So what will happen with that is that, um, and I have to show you a picture of this at some point or a video of this. Um, so what the artist sees and what the audience sees is different. Mm -hmm. So what's cool about this is that the artist is able to see a backstage area. So basically on your right hand side, um, you have all the artists who are in the room, but they are hidden from the audience. And then the stage in the center, the audience is able to see that they're able to interact with the performer. And then the person who is running the show, it could be the stage manager who's off screen or one of the performers is able to bring those artists from off stage, bring them on stage um, at, at their lead 
nature. And so we have worked with improv. Yeah, it is super cool. We've worked with improv troops. Um, the um, We have like an improv troupe in Chicago who has used basically this backstage and onstage feature to bring people in and out like they're jumping on and off the stage, doing a lot of interactive activity like that. So this is literally for improv, comedy, musicians, magicians, whoever feels like they can cultivate a really strong show and a strong audience online. How fun. I love, yeah. love that idea. And have you had anyone use it in a hybrid way where like they're performing in front of a real audience and then they're also doing showcast? That's a great question. We've had questions about that. Right now we're focusing mostly on just the online portion to really get that set, um, get it very you know, customized for the online experience. Mm -hmm. But eventually what we'd love to do is create a Showcast app where you're able to interact like on your phone while you're watching and have an online audience watching all that. But we want to make sure we start off with where we're strongest, yep. really get that dialed down, get a lot of, you know, customer, a huge customer base with that, and then start moving into the features for hybrid shows. Cool, cool. Well, I'm I'm excited to check this out. I'm yeah, absolutely. Very cool because it's so tailored to artists. Yeah, definitely, and also for podcasts. So if you ever want to use it for a podcast, oh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, actually, I'm thinking like, oh, virtual summit. This could be like a yeah. really good way to do a virtual summit. Absolutely. So check into that because I'm thinking about doing one pretty soon again. So that sounds. Oh, I love that. Really cool. Um, <laughs> okay, let's switch over to your artist career because there's yeah. so much to talk about there too. You have a lot, you have developed a lot of skills, which mm. I love because, and we talked about this before we started recording that, you know, I'm super big on multiple streams of income and yeah. like stacking your income and, you know, getting this solid base of these things that you can make money in and then stacking more things on top. Mm -hmm. And you've really developed your skill sets across the board. Is that something you were developing these all together at the same time? Or it was like, I focused on this skill and then I dialed that in and then I moved to production or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I think kind of what has happened in my journey is I have a lot of interests. And so rather than being like, oh, I need to develop this skill in order to help my music career, it was kind of like, oh, I find this thing interesting. I'm going to go ahead and take the time to learn about it and get relatively good at it. And then finding out later, like, oh, this skill actually can translate into helping me with the other things that I'm doing as well. You know, so I think it's like what I try to encourage musicians, artists, anybody to do is identify their areas of interest and recognize that even if it seems unrelated to your career, um, if you can get good at that, that could actually probably very much help you moving forward. It can help you in a lot of different random ways you might not even be able to see now, but cultivating your gifts in that way, um, just organically as they come up, I think is super helpful. I think that is such a good point. And I know I spoke to a, a group of college students a couple of years ago, and this is something that I really tried to put forward to them to think about, like, what are the things that you just like, you love doing when you're not being paid to do them or, you know, like when you have time, what mm -hmm. do you love doing? And like, for me, I was like obsessed with making mixtapes as I was mm -hmm. growing up. Like, and now of course this is like translated into, you know, playlisting and um, creating podcasts and things like that. And originally when I started uh, my women of Sub substance platform, it was an online radio, but mm -hmm. like who knew that I could build a business yeah. around my obsession with making mixtapes. Now it's not mixtapes anymore, but that, that exact skill of like me being a really good playlister, like, you know, knowing what songs go well together and things like that, that that would become a business that yeah. I started everything on and have built my business all the way from there till now. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way I could have known that. Right. And I started my online radio station. It was a total hobby, right? Because yeah. I was obsessed with mixtapes and playlisting. And then that grew into something that eventually started making money. And then I started connecting with musicians and now I'm here, right? Yeah, so exactly. You never know where it's going to take you. Exactly. And I think keeping that in mind, rather than being like, this is not making me money right now, I shouldn't do it. If you look at any artist career, any business person's career, it very, the really successful ones very rarely start out with, I'm going to find something that's going to make me the most money now and do it. And then they get successful. That very rarely happens. What mostly happens is someone identifies their passion. They do it because they love it, like you said. And then they're able to find ways over time to then monetize it. 
and find again where the need is so i think the more that you can just find what you love and that will also give you the motivation to keep doing it because if you're just doing something to make money after time you're not gonna you know you're gonna lose that motivation you're gonna burn out you're gonna want to stop doing it but if you're doing something you absolutely love you're intrinsically motivated to keep doing it just because you enjoy it and then you're able to better find re you know income sources that come from that that's right and also if you do it let's say you learn something to do it for yourself or your own career and you get good at it. like for example i learned to produce from home right mm. because i wanted to put music out and that kind of thing mm. and but then you start doing it people see you doing it and they're like oh could you record me could you yeah. produce me could you yeah. arrange for me and like that totally. was never the original intent right but when you do it and you do it well and you did it for yourself because you wanted to and you love it people mm. see that and then that suddenly starts attracting this these potential money making things and then mm. you got to decide well do i want to do this for other people do i want to make money that way it, am i passionate about that you know totally totally <laughs> but it could also be like, yeah, I could use a little extra money right now. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll do that. And then you have the skill set to do it because right. you took the time to like become good. At, and I think that something you mentioned is really important is become good at it. You know, like if you're going to do something and you enjoy it, like take it as far as you can go, you know, like because I think that one thing that is not going to help is if you start dabbling in something and then like don't take the time to actually you know master it and obviously not having to become like the best at it ever but if you are able to get to a point where you feel like i'm good at this enough that i could actually sell this then i think you're you've put yourself in a good position yeah i mean for me like i certainly was no amazing producer right but i got to the point where it's like i would put this out on the internet and not be embarrassed by it you know exactly huge level, right? <laughs> huge yeah <laughs> that's so funny um so what are what are kind of all the skills that you've developed that have helped your artist career that are kind of like hanging out in the background like i could actually make income from this yeah, I mean, it's been quite a few um, over over again the years. I mean, I've been doing this for more than a decade now, like 13 years. Um, so I recently started producing my own music, as as you were saying that you've done as well. I have started using like Logic, um, started really putting together my own tracks. And so that's been a big one for me, as well as I'm learning how to do video editing with Final Cut Pro to try to make lyric videos and music videos for myself. Um, I've also learned the very basics of like graphic design when it comes to creating social media content, um, learning about social media, becoming better about like what pops off on Instagram. You know, like I found for me that when I post live performance videos, those pop off a lot more than some of the other stuff that I post. So I post those a lot, you know, it's so, like learning about what really gets an audience on social media, learning more about fashion in order to try to find like, you know, outfits for me to wear um yeah it's been kind of like a lot of those different things as well as like guerrilla marketing techniques mm. like because when you're an independent artist you know you're not coming in with label money behind you so but i think that some of the best campaigns come from you know having to be creative because you don't have the money behind you if you look at even like movies like blair witch project you know like starting with a very low budget but they were able to use it so creatively to create a buzz around it um, so I've tried to kind of cultivate those different things and I'm sure there's others, but those are just kind of the ones that come to mind of the different skill sets that I've kind of learned over the years that I've been able to kind of integrate into my artist's career. Yeah, that's awesome. And what's great is you keep it in house. You don't have to pay other people. Yeah, you know? exactly. You can do as much of it yourself. You know, we always, we either have money or we have time, right? So yeah. <laughs> time instead exactly. of paying someone else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whereas maybe instead, like if you're super busy with showcast, then you would have to maybe hire some of that stuff out. Right. Exactly. So it just depends on kind of where you're at. Now, are there certain things that you're just like, you know what, I'm never going to be good at this, or I, it is not my zone of genius, or I don't like to do it that I re that you really do hire out. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm a big proponent of recognizing what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. So the idea, like if you want to just put stuff out for fun and you don't have a huge, like, oh, I want to make money from this, then you can do everything yourself. And as long as you don't worry about the quality, right. but I know for me, like I have learned how to produce and I'm getting better at it. I don't know anything about mixing. I don't know how to mix my music to be to the level where it could be played on the radio or played on a playlist so i hire a mixer i also don't know how to master my music so yeah. i hire a master you know um and also when it comes to graphic design for my album artwork i can do graphic design for my social media posts i cannot do that for my album artwork i'm not that creative in that way so then i hire someone else to do that as well 
so yeah, I think that definitely understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are and being okay with admitting that you're not good at everything is I think a big deal. Yeah. Oh, we're so much on the same page. I hired out all those things. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, cause I'm not going to learn, I'm not going to learn how to master. Like it's such a, it's a precision art, you know, it takes so many years to become good enough at it right. to like have your stuff be at the level it needs to be, to be played on radio. So I'm like, I, I don't have the time to like learn all that. I can easily hire someone else to do that for me. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I, I always like to ask this, um, when it comes to artists is like, what, since you do have so many talents and skills and and ways that you could learn income what is your what does your income look like as far as like a pie you know like where is how much of it is coming in from live performances merch things like that mm -hmm. yeah i mean so i have a couple different income streams so and i also tend to think that a lot of artists are very similar of like, okay, we have money coming in from a lot of different places in order to allow for the flexibility to do our art. Yep. So I'm not making a ton of money off of my art right now. I've just kind of gotten started in this new brand. So I would say a big portion of my, my funds comes from live performing with dueling pianos for sure. Um, I usually am gigging every single weekend, uh, sometimes during the week as well. Um, so that's the thing. And then I also have a day job. I work at a dueling pianos company. They do entertainment. I've, I'm their director of virtual events because I had experience creating my own company. I was able to be hired on as a director for them. So I do their virtual events and I also work in quality control for them, helping them identify areas in their business that are maybe falling short and then helping fix those areas. Real again, really random skills that I've developed just by owning my own company. Um, so then that would take about another 50, 50% of my income. So combining those two gives me not only enough money to live, but also to save and then invest in my career. It's a lot to juggle, but it's, I think the best case scenario for me, for sure. It is. And you're still, you're still keeping up all your performing chops because you're performing yes. all the time. You're exactly. in the world. You know, I just, it's crazy. I just did a live stream that I made a podcast out of it of this kind of like the idea of like, should you have a plan B or is it good to mm. have like a second side hustle or whatever? Mm. And you know, what I was saying about it is like, you don't want to be in the position with your art where you are so stressed out about money. Like where is rent going to come from? Yeah. Because you get into this mindset or like it, it messes with your head and it makes it really hard for you to actually go out and get the gigs or get the sales that you need because you've got that desperation kind of hanging out like this, like this dark cloud over you, like people can feel it. Absolutely. And I was saying, it's like when you're, when you're hiring someone for a job, you can tell when someone is like really needs the job versus someone else who's like, they have a job and they just want a different job. Yeah. It's totally different energy. Right. Absolutely. I think that also with that, like I would not even see having a second job or a job to support you as a plan B, you right. know, like for, for me, uh, my artistry is like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And I am going to figure out a way, like someday I'm going to be real successful. And that will be the only thing that I have to do. Right. But in order to have that plan A, which is my only plan, I have nothing else that I'm going to do other than that. <laughs> I have to have money to support that. And so that is like, that is just a part of what makes it sustainable for you to do your art as long as you need to to become successful. It's very rare that you have people who come in, have that viral hit within the first year of them making music, and then they're off to the races. This is a lot of times an endurance game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So you have to be able to live and like support yourself long enough to develop the skills that you need to then become a successful artist. Yeah, totally. And the thing is, what I think is great about what you're doing is you're still like in the same world. Like it's not like, you're yes, thankfully, you know, my other job is waiting tables or walking mm -hmm. dogs or whatever, you know, where you're having to like, like switch these worlds. Like you're able to, all the skills that you're getting in your day job is like translate and your skills that you're getting in your art are like translating between the two things. Yeah. And so you're constantly building that skill set as you're working within it. And like, when I think about the whole plan B thing, the reason I said plan B like is because for me, like business was plan B because I had no mm. idea how I was going to become a musician because my mm. college didn't teach me how mm -hmm. it turned out that my plan B and my plan A merged <laughs> to mm. do what I'm doing. Right. That's but awesome. Yeah. That time. Totally. And so it's like, it can be very different. It can be like, Oh no, this is just a side hustle. Like I'm always doing music or I'm doing this plan B, but then like, Oh, maybe this actually can be part of plan A. Yeah. Absolutely. I think in having that flexibility within yourself to be like, not so rigid that you're like, 
I have to only do this, even when other things come along to where you're like, oh, wait, I actually really like this. It's like allowing that flexibility to then bring that in and having your plan adapt and grow as you adapt and grow. You know, our dreams change as we get older, as we have more life experience. And that's totally okay. And that's a good thing. If we had, if I had the same dream that I had when I was 12 years old, like, I mean, I still kind of do just to be a rock star, but you know, it's changed a little bit because now I also want to, you know, own businesses. Like my goal is, when, you know, when I become a very successful artist, I want to like start other businesses, you know, do investment, have an investment portfolio, like, and your dream has to grow and change with you. And and I think it's a really good thing to have that happen. Yeah, absolutely. My idea of what I was going to do in music in my twenties was so different than it was in my thirties and forties. Yeah, so absolutely. What's going to happen, but <laughs> it doesn't mean you're not going to do music. It just means, no, you know, for sure. For sure. And it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, as a female artist in the industry, do you, you know, what do you find are like the biggest challenges specifically for females? Yeah. I mean, this it's interesting. I think that it's being taken seriously, you know, um, I think that especially as a female performer, when you're in the live music industry, it is, it's very male dominated. It's very easy for men to just kind of be like, oh, she's just a chick singer. She's just, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and also in production, you know, like it's, I, I remember I recently, I had created a song, I produced a song, one of my first songs that I produced and my mixer sent it to somebody and the guy was like, yeah, well, it sounds like a demo. She should probably get a producer to help her. And I, and I was like, mm, mm, don't like that. So then, but actually it motivated me to get better, you know? So it was very much like a, it was very frustrating. It hurt, but I was like, cool. I needed to hear that because I'm going to prove you wrong that I don't need, I don't need to rely on somebody else. I can collaborate and work with other people, but I don't need to rely on somebody else to make my music for me. Um, but I think you see that a lot in the industry. I think you see a lot of uh, men who will discount women, maybe think that they are not again, to be taken seriously or as capable. And I think the way to overcome that is just coming in with so much confidence and knowing exactly who you are exactly the skill set that you bring in and being able to firmly communicate that in a respectful way. Um, and I've found that doing that has um, really helped and I've been able to not have as many problems as some other of my female friends have. Um, I just come in with a, just a very like kind of an aggressive energy of like, you will take me seriously. Yeah, like, you that's definitely it. got <laughs> that down. I, I tell you yeah. this interview that you've definitely got that down and, and it is necessary a lot of times. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when we talk about things specific to women in the industry, right? A lot of people are like, they, they resonate with that. I said something on Instagram the other day, and I got this major pushback from somebody who was like, I've never experienced any different treatment in the industry. Why would, should we even talk about being treated differently? And so there's how like long you've been in the of, industry for? <laughs> no, like, well, there's like that idea of like, if we bring this to light that like, we are being treated differently, then somehow that's going to make it true or somehow that's making us less than like, she just wanted to like ignore that there was any difference whatsoever. Well, that that's coming from a place of ignorance in my opinion. And also it's like, how long, honestly, how long have you been in the industry? If you're saying that you have never seen women be treated there, literally the other day I was at a, uh, a jam that I go to, that's wonderful. Um, and, but the sound guy was paying very close attention to the male singer who was asking for levels to change and then when a female singer came up he she had to scream in order to get his opinion his attention for him to change the levels and he didn't change them correctly like little things like that and if you are not seeing that happening then you you probably aren't in the industry honestly i've definitely like, been in that one before with my yeah. female band let me tell you what not just one female but four three females yeah they they like triple ignore you yeah exactly <laughs> there's like no <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i know it's it's a, it's frustrating and i do feel like it's gotten better i do feel like there's a lot yes. more you know a lot more people realizing that these issues happen and doing something about them and speaking out and all that stuff you know, since when I really started talking about this stuff back in 2015, when I started Mm. my female entrepreneur musician podcast, like, I do think that things have gotten better, but they're, they're still there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the thing that's going to help continue to get them, get this to be better is for women to see other women Mm -hmm. speaking out about it and also doing something about it. You know, it's like when you see a woman who stands up for herself 
in situations like this, I think it empowers you to stand up for yourself as well. Well, she did it, I can do it. You know, I think it's just that representation of women in the industry as producers, as session musicians, uh, again, in very male dominated spaces, um, doing the gig just as good, most of the time better than their male counterparts is huge. And I think will help the next generation come up and they will see less and less of this issue because of that. Yeah, I know. I was just talking to a female songwriter who, you know, had has had tons of hits. And she's like, yeah, I was the only female songwriter at Warner Chapel. Oh, <laughs> these, 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 this year. Now, this was back in, the, I think, or late 70s, early 80s. Right. right. So yeah. Surprising. Yeah. But I don't think it's the case now. I no. still think it's male dominated. But I think it's not nearly as much the case. And I also think there's a lot of female songwriters who have come out as singer songwriter artists mm-hmm. to show people like, yeah, females are awesome songwriters. Oh yeah. BB Rexa, Charlie XCX, Julia Michaels. Like, yeah, there's like so many incredible female songwriters. And it's interesting because I think that's a perfect example of that. Cause you see a lot of females moving into the songwriting portion. We got to get more female producers. Like that is another, the next area that I think we just need to see a lot more women coming into because again, that is very male dominated. And, but it's cool. Cause we're again, seeing that wave it's, it's happening, but we just have to continue to encourage women, especially young girls um, to know that they can do it. I never saw an example of a, another female producer when I was young, I was so scared to start working with logic to start working in production. Um, Cause I just never saw someone like me doing it. But now again, we're seeing more examples of that. And I think it's super there important. Are. It's so great. I mean, my friend, Chris Bradley, it produced like a boss and um, mm. you know, the girls at, at, um, at soundgirls.org. Like there's a lot of people really trying to make waves in that space. I love that. And That's awesome. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that we you want to bring up or talk about while we're here? We've talked about so much stuff and it's all been, I think, really educational to artists. Is there anything else you want to mention? Um, I think check out my song Becoming Human. That's probably the last thing I would mention. It's my first, the first one that I uh that I've released under this new brand. Um, my new brand is my genre is electronic pop. It's kind of a mix of Florence and the Machine and Grimes. I call it synth with soul. Um, So if you like that kind of music, check out Becoming Human on Spotify or wherever you stream music. Um, And then keep an eye out for other songs that I have coming out. But other than that, I've been so grateful to talk with you and be able to talk about such important topics like this. And hopefully people have gained something from this conversation. Definitely. And how do they connect with you on social? Yep, they can follow me at Bree Music Page, B-R-E Music Page on pretty much every social thing. So Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. I never tweet. I need to start doing that. I've heard it's important. Are you on TikTok? Um, I am on TikTok as well. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, you guys go follow her. And what about your platform for musicians to perform? Yeah, no, it's Showcast. So yeah, if Showcast, you want to learn more about Showcast, go to showcast.live. That's S-H-O-C-A-S-T dot live. And then there's a button on there. We can go ahead and get in contact with us. We can get you set up with an account. Again, it's free to use. And it is such an awesome way to connect with your audience. Got it. So showcast, but no W. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Awesome. (laughs) Okay. Thank you so much, Bree. This has been such a great, I think it's just been like a lot of great energy, a lot of confidence and a lot of, you guys can do this. You can do it. it. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.